Hi everybody, welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. Uh, this is a, a place where we talk about photography topics like business ownership and just generally have an honest conversation. My name is Tom Wright. I'm a commercial photographer, videographer and educator. And yeah, this is just going to be an open conversation with a bunch of like-minded people. If you ever want to be involved in these chats, feel free to follow the link in the podcast description. And yeah, we're going to get right into the chat. So to kind of give people a bit of an overview of who's here and who you are, we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves so people know a little bit of context. Just make sure you give your full name and let us know where people can find your stuff so they can have a bit of a, a blog stalk while we're, we're chatting. So Neil, did you want to start? Yeah, sure, man. Uh, yeah, I'm Neil, uh, Neil Thomas Douglas. Uh, I am a wedding and elopement photographer based in Scotland, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh most known, known probably from a work up in Glencoe and the Highlands of Scotland. And awesome work it is too. Like, let's be fair. Like you, you kind of kept that fully Scottish and like low key, but come on. Like, <laughs> like you're a photographer extraordinaire. Like people should know about it. Like where can they find your work now? Where's the best place to check you out? Is it your website or an Instagram? What's better for you? Hey, well, I was just saying before we hit record that I've, I've only posted once since August on Instagram. Uh, and I don't know why. I just don't like it. Uh, but yeah, my website, neilthomasdouglas.com, or my work's all on Instagram as well. I was, I did post before, but I'm just too dislike it to it. So, <laughs> this is going to be a really good segue for today's discussion. <laughs> um, so, just to kind of go around the room again. So, we've got Leah returning from last week. So, if you're listening to the previous podcast, she'll be a familiar voice. But for anybody that didn't listen before, Leah, do you want to give a quick introduction about where people can find you, what kind of work you do, and a little bit about your business? Yeah, I am based in the great state of Texas, USA. Uh, I'm Leah Thomason. You can find me pretty much anywhere with leahthomasonphotography.com. Instagram's all the same thing too. And I'm a wedding and portrait photographer. Awesome. That's great. And Micah, so you're next up on the chopping block. So do you want to give people a bit of an introduction to you, your business and where you're at and where you're coming from? Yeah. So um, I'm Micah Nelson. Um, I am based out of um, East Tennessee. Um, and I am primarily a, um, wedding photographer. Um, I also do some boudoir, um, and I am pretty new to the game. Um, so I've only been, I've had my business license for about two years, but I've really only been, uh, doubling down for about a year and a half or so. So, um, I'm really honored to be here with you guys. You're welcome. Always, like we, we don't really care, like have any kind of set skill levels or anything else. As long as you're a photographer and you've got something to say, we want to be a support group for you. So, like, feel free to come as and when. Good to have you here, Micah. And Simon, you're next up. So, do you want to give people a bit of an overview? It sounds like we've got the full Scottish contingent today. <laughs> yeah, I've got the accent to match, though. Um, yeah, so I'm Simon. I'm a photographer based in Edinburgh, but originally from the south coast of England. Um, I do a mixture of kind of commercial travel photography and then also I'm a wedding photographer as well and that's kind of underplaying you a little bit like you're you've been published in an awful lot of magazines recently <laughs> if any of you flipped open a rucksack magazine lately you might accidentally have seen Simon's work unless I'm completely <laughs> mistaken but yeah so that there's a, some really cool stuff there where can people check you out Simon um just Simon Heard on Instagram or Simon Heard Weddings or simonheard.com probably the best place to find Simon. that's all cool nice one and ollie like you're, you're back again from last week again like we're, we're missing staff this week but if you want to give people a bit a bit of a refresher as to who you are and what kind of work you do that would be great yeah hey tom um so i'm ollie one half of ollie and steph photography steph might come through later on in the call um yeah we've been photographing elopements i've been full-time um like you micah for one year and we were sort of part-time for about two years before that um yeah, really excited to be in this group. It's really nice to finally meet uh, Neil or kind of meet face to face. I followed your work for a while. So, yeah, nice to meet you, dude. Yeah, good to meet you too, dude. I was thinking that there and I was like, yeah, yeah. In last week's discussion, just for as a quick recap, we we're talking about the way that business had changed since the lockdown, the kind of shrinking of dates before weddings, people booking like weeks ahead of time, not months or years, um, the booking periods changing a little bit. And the conversation kind of came around so that the majority of us that were in the commercial space, had found that our clients had started asking us for both stills and video. And we were talking about the convergence of different media. Um, the conversation ended up getting onto Instagram though, because all the commercial folks were saying that they hadn't posted on Instagram in forever on any kind of professional basis, but they'd found out that they were using the platform differently. So rather than speak for everybody last week, my Instagram use just changed quite a lot. 
So I have an account with a following of around about 3,000 people. I'm about 50 under that. And my account is almost entirely reels, which don't get posted to the grid, story posts, and direct messages. I don't think I've actually made a concerted effort to post actual photography work to the grid in a very long time because I realized none of my clients are looking at it. And actually, in my case, a lot of my work is done either under non-disclosure or with the expectation that I'm not going to be posting that work because it's being used on their social media instead. So for me, it kind of felt natural to, to kind of make that shift. But through the course of that conversation that we had last week, it became pretty obvious that I wasn't alone and that regardless of industry, the way that people you were using Instagram had changed. Um, it's interesting you say that, Tom, because I actually feel very similar to you. Um, a lot of the work I do um, in, a, in the commercial capacity is for um, a magazine. And most of that isn't necessarily stuff I would typically post on Instagram. It's maybe behind the scenes at businesses, breweries, restaurants, that kind of stuff. Um, where it's, I've always kind of lent to posting like personal work or landscapes or travel stuff. So I think more and more, I feel like I'm using Instagram to post personal work more so than commercial stuff which I think I'm finding I enjoy more. Um, I tr try, and it's easy to sometimes think, oh, no one's, not many people are seeing this as before. But I try not to worry too much about that and just enjoy sharing my work and what I'm doing because I've always found on the commercial side of things, I always, when, it, when I've found clients through Instagram, it's often been based on the personal work that I've shot. Um, so I've tried to keep that, keep that up from that side of things on my wedding side of things, I've been terrible. I'm not with posting at all. So <laughs> um, I don't know. I think maybe it's, it's, it's tricky now because, you know, there's obviously the prioritization of video. Um, and whilst I would, I do shoot a lot of video, it's, you know, I guess it's maybe not what a lot of us thought we were going to do when we originally signed up to uh, Instagram. So it's a bit, a little bit of a changing, a bit, a little bit of a change of like what, how I use the app, I suppose. Like you said, it, it, a lot of us came into this room and we all started out as photographers. In my case, we discussed this previously uh, last week, that that change towards video was very much driven by client demand. Like The reason we did that is because people needed it and wanted it. And we had a visual language and a rapport with the client and that kind of like segued into doing that work. Um, so I'm definitely with you on the video side. And it's interesting that you were saying about not being motivated to post for the wedding side of it. Because I think today, the vast majority of the people here are going to be predominantly uh, wedding focused. Um, speaking of, Leah, last week, you were talking about how you saw your Instagram more as like a community driving tool. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you've been using Instagram and how it's been feeling for you? Uh, yeah, so... Um... I did a big leap last year and I actually hired somebody to do a lot of my Instagram posting for me um, because I was just seeing, especially in the area of Texas that I live in, it's super saturated. And like, I don't really get into like a whole like, oh, the market is oversaturated. But like the area that I specifically live in in Texas is a huge like wedding industry. Like people come here to get married. It's like, I live in a destination wedding spot in, in the hill country of Texas. So I was like, well, and I, I hated posting on Instagram. It takes so much time. I like, so I, I, I hear all of y'all's like, Ugh. and so I was like, well, for me to be able to like show up, I'm just going to have to have somebody do it for me. <laughs> so I made that leap last year and even through doing that, and I'm continuing to have her do it this year as well, um, I noticed a huge increase in my interactions with like my current couples. And so I kind of stopped the focus of posting to get business and have it focused more on showcasing like more portfolio work so that my couples especially my brides, because they're the ones that are on Instagram. We know the boys aren't there very much. <laughs> um, they would see a post and like immediately like, oh, Leah, I want to pose like this at my wedding. Or can we do something like this? So I ended up seeing it more as like a way to interact and build a way to build further trust with my couples by posting to Instagram regularly and having that interaction through DMs and them sharing stuff versus it being so much of a tool to drive 
traffic to my website or my contact form or to get inquiries. Um, and that's been super helpful in that shift um, versus it trying to be such a like a competitive market as far as like this is where I get my leads like I, I could care less my leads have gone up from Instagram in the last year just by being consistent there but it's not my it's not my drive to be there to get inquiries my drive to be there is to build more trust with my my clients over the course of uh, our time together so you, you, this is what I meant before when you said that you're making the posting a conversation starter for an existing audience. You, you're trying to build mm-hmm. something that's not for everybody. It's not even for everybody getting married. It's only for people that are already like so seriously interested in booking you. And in some cases, they've already made the leap to book because um, mm-hmm. it, it kind of changes the way that you look at your Instagram account. Not only are you not trying to build an audience there, you're just trying to maintain an audience you've brought with you if you like um yeah with with that sorry go ahead Leah no no that's go ahead um with that said like Micah so we haven't heard from you yet like how do you find using Instagram have you found it to be a useful lead generation tool like do you use it to cater to an existing audience what does it do for you How, how is that social media platform working for you and your business first of all I am not great at social media um and like great at social media as in uh number one being consistent uh and showing up that way so that way people know what they can expect um and then uh essentially essentially i i don't show up consistently but uh, i'm working on that but what i have found uh instagram to be the m- extremely beneficial for me and my business is actually using it as a tool to connect with other vendors um in the wedding industry so um something that's surprisingly not common in my area is for photographers to go out of their way to email um images to vendors from a wedding day um and then those vendors now have uh photos that they can post to their instagram um and that's led to those some of the specific vendors reaching out to me specifically for like content photos that they've got going on this summer and stuff like that. Um, but also like <laughs> cold calling on Instagram, essentially, like you can you can sometimes um, facilitate relationship building by showing up on other people's Instagram feeds. So like, if you like an image, just say, wow, I really love the colors in this photo and something like that. If you're trying to connect with a photographer, not in a way to like manipulate them into talking to you, but you're just showing up. And I've found that just by showing up, um, I've made so many great vendor connections, not only with other photographers, but with uh, wedding planners and um, stuff like that, that otherwise like, there's not a whole lot of networking events. Um, where I am. Um, so it's been a great opportunity to, to essentially get connected with other people, which then leads to clients. Uh, because right now I don't have enough work on my social media to attract clients, if that makes sense. That makes sense to me. So it sounds like you, you're taking a community approach, but from a different angle. You're yeah. um, looking at your Instagram as a way to build a community around the the industry of weddings and not necessarily trying to sell direct to a consumer. So it's, it's kind of giving you an opportunity to get close to the people that are likely to want to work with you and not necessarily the people that would want to hire you, which is another interesting approach. So um, just to kind of quickly go through and make sure we hear from everybody, um, Neil and Ollie, like, so you're both, you're both doing a very kind of, you're servicing similar audiences in that you're looking for people looking for elopements and kind of like adventure photography. And it would be interesting to hear from both of you, both of you about your approaches and whether or not you really feel like Instagram is making a meaningful impact in your business. And like, if you're not posting, like what's holding you back from posting? Is it a lack of inspiration? Like where, where's that resistance coming from? Uh, Neil, did you want to start? Uh, yeah, I just, I just don't really care about it. <laughs> I just don't like social media. It's uh, uh I never have. It's a, I just find it a pain. 
to post. I don't really go on it either to look at people's work or anything. Like if I go on it, it's to look at videos of goats or something, you know. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I just never really got into it. And I, I don't think I've got into the groove, you know. Like if I, I think if I made it a habit, like on Monday I have got up and I scheduled my three posts and stuff like that and then I just forgot about it, then I might be a bit better and I've always meant to do that. Uh, I had to post in December there because brides were DMing me and emailing me asking if I was okay. <laughs> Basically asking if I was alive uh, because I hadn't posted anything. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in the other sense, uh, I've been doing it that long. I, I still get bookings, inquiries and stuff and I do just fine without it. But, uh, yeah, I'm always conscious of it. It's always niggling in the back of my mind to, to be better. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm now waiting for the Neil Thomas Douglas feed that's literally just cat memes. Like I'm I'm ready I'm ready I'm ready for like Neil Neil Douglas's like j- just memeatorium cuz like I, I think on some level I think there's kind of room for that. Like I, th- I think a lot of the time like if if Lee is correct and the main thing we're trying to do is build a connection with people that might already have booked us or like you said mm. just prove I'm not dead like sharing a cat meme might not be the worst thing on the planet, especially if you book in couples that are actually pretty chill out and easy going and don't mind that kind of stuff as well. Um, so yeah, I'm fully ready for the cat memes. Yeah. I've got a question about uh, reels. So they don't, they don't, reels don't show up in your grid. Um, so there, there are choices essentially. I'm, I'm definitely going to touch on this in a minute for sure, mm-hmm. but just to give you answer your question in brief, when you post a reel, you can choose to post it to the grid or you can have it appeal in a separate reels tab, which only kind of like shows up if somebody clicks over. So you could have like a nice, ah. pretty curated feed and then like all the cat memes in a separate tab that people would have to navigate to. And that's fine. Um, I didn't and- know that. I've actually just uh, subscribed to a course to make me a better Instagrammer on uh, in December, but it's just sitting there ready to be watched today. This this is honestly the number one thing with online online education. Like um, when you buy pre recorded courses, apparently the dropout rate after the first video is somewhere around ninety five percent. So most people will buy the course, do the first module, and then never touch anything else again. So um, you're not alone, Neil. At least you've kind of like you've booked the trend and gone for the full. I've not watched any of it, so you've gone full hundred percent, which I think is quite <laughs> impressive. So the, t- the um, TV's so good just now, though, isn't it? They just release all the good stuff in the in the winter. Uh, so, absolutely so many other options other than an instagram educational video but i will do it i mean all i can think is that you're sitting there watching like andor on disney plus like just like drooling over the cinematography and thinking like oh, one day my images yeah, are going to look like this <laughs> um, but yeah so, like, so just to kind of make sure again we, we hear from everybody ollie um we did hear a little bit about your approach last week but to kind of get a bit of a feel for it like how do you approach your instagram because obviously you guys are actually quite active and it's really interesting to see the way you deal with it yeah um i could talk at length about the subject for sure and it's a shame steph's not here because she's more articulate and this really is her area of expertise um i'll just say quickly you're talking about reels and whether you should post them to your grid like we're not experts at reels we've been pretty lazy with them but one thing we did learn is that it's important to post them to your grid initially and also share them in your stories because straight away that will give you a lot more um, eyes on the reel and more chance of it exploding. Um, if it looks ugly on your grid, you can remove it, you know, like after a week or something. So that's that's what we tend to do. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, like I think the thing with Instagram and all social media platforms is just to do what works for you and what feels right for you. I think like if you don't enjoy it, <clears throat> there's plenty of other ways to get lead sources um, and to make money um, for us. You know, like a lot of people hate on Instagram and I get it, it is a pain and it can be a total leech of your time if you're not careful. But we've always we've always found Instagram kind of easy and I'm quite lucky I work with Steph and she is just a powerhouse at, at particularly stories. We learned early on from some education from Rebecca Carpenter, the, the power of Instagram stories. And so for the last, well, since we started this business, we've, we've just churned out stories every day. And, you know, like I, I remember the first time Steph got me to talk on camera, it took me about 20 times until I was happy to post it. And now I don't give a damn. She's like, oh, you just talk on camera and I'll do it. And it's, you, you just kind of, you get used to it, right? 
Um, Ollie, that's good to hear, man, because yeah. that's, that's a course I, I bought the Rebecca Carpenter one. So, yeah, this is... Oh, this sweet. Is to so I should actually watch it, yeah? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, Neil, I didn't actually... It wasn't a course at that point that I bought from her. I just went... When I when we first got into wedding photography and we we're thinking of niching to elopements, I went on a few of her style shoots. I went to a photography farm workshop she did, and she's just very passionate about social media. I think she's like... I think she's one of the dons of Instagram. Um, so she's a brilliant person to learn from, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go as far as to say, like, I think Instagram made us loads of money last year. And, you know, it's a free tool. Like, you don't have to pay to use it. It's just sitting there. Um, and we really use it. I think we use it to sort of qualify ourselves to our leads. Um, we spoke about this last last week, right? And Leah's been talking about it a bit again today. We use it in a similar fashion. I'm not sure we get that many leads now from Instagram. We did, we got more last year, and now the majority of our leads are coming through um, SEO. But I think they probably go onto our Instagram account, if not before they booked us, then definitely after they booked us, and they follow our lives on here. And then by the time it comes to their elopement, I should qualify this and say we live on the Isle of Skye. So you know we're dealing with a lot of American couples that are very excited about coming to the Isle of Skye for the first time, and they're watching our lives on Instagram. And they, they kind of fall in love with it a bit. You know, they, by the time it gets to their elopement, they want to talk about everything we're doing here. They want to come and meet our dogs. They want to come over for a coffee. Um, and that is our approach, you know, and that doesn't suit everyone. Not every photographer wants to be best friends with all their couples. It just happens that for us, that's that works well. And we find we can charge a premium with our couples for it as well. You know, I'd go as far as to say there's, there's probably much better photographers than us in Scotland but we're probably charging more money. And I think part of it is because we give so much of ourselves on social media and we share that with our, with our couples and throughout their, their whole wedding journey. Also, if you're marketing to Americans, Ollie, then you can, yeah. you can charge more because uh, they spend more. Yeah, yeah 100%. We, it's more in their culture, you, America. isn't it? We love you. <laughs> it's like thank you for keeping us in hot dinners americans is what they're trying to say I think. You it's are interesting so welcome. between you and micah like we're all being fed here this is great um, <laughs> i think you, you kind of make a good point and i like the fact that this is the conversation because it's a two-way thing because in the end like leah was kind of like reluctant but is seeing what you're talking about and the, the difference is that for you guys like you actually realize that it's a core part of your service it, it's so important to your customer journey to your client experience because they do need to feel like they know I like, can trust you. And because you're literally on the other side of the world, how else are they going to do that if they can't like get regular check-ins and contacts? And yeah. like, they yeah. don't want to be in a system where there's any fear when they get on the flight as to whether or not you're going to be there on the other end, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what, right? We, um, uh, just about two weeks ago, I ended up in hospital. First time in my life I was in hospital. And uh, Steph put the story up of me just looking completely wiped out, um, you know, on the hospital bed. And we've never had a story get so much interaction. It was insane. Like we just had hundreds of comments from it. Um, and I think that kind of just shows the power of it. Every one of our couples checked in with us. and was like, oh my God. Is I mean, they're probably worried like I was going to be too sick for their for their wedding day or something. But um, yeah, just for us, it just it just seems like a no brainer for getting that, you know, getting that, um, that link with your couples. I've definitely started seeing, because I've booked several couples for this year that aren't even Texas based couples. They're like ones from like Boston and they're getting married in Austin, which is like two hours from me. But like, we're not like, I'm going to show up on wedding day and that's how we're going to meet for the first time. And so the way Ollie described using stories and Instagram to kind of stay connected with them um, is definitely a huge mental shift. And I've kind of already done some of that organically just in the way I've started approaching Instagram, doing it less for the gram and more for the sake of staying connected with my couples. And if new couples come in and they happen to like connect with what I'm saying, awesome, but I'm not necessarily like showing up for them. Um, so that's a really great mindset shift, Ollie, is to like having that connection stay consistent for the couples that you're going to be working with, especially, you know, with the you know, Americans coming over to the Isle of Skye to elope, like then they already feel like they're getting to know you and have kind of um, have that rapport built ahead of time versus like showing up cold Turkey 
on the day of the elopement, you know? It's definitely that top of mind awareness, I think, that you guys are definitely working on. It, it feels like you're building such a strong community. There's no better feeling. We have um, Zoom consultation calls with our couples when they want to book us. And there's nothing better when you get on that call and straight away um, a couple like say something like, oh, can we can we see Shackleton? That's one of our dogs. Or, you know, ask us about something that's going on in our lives. It, it, it just makes it so much easier on those calls. You kind of know they're already invested in you. Um, you know, probably before you even show them the pricing, they want you. Um, yeah, and it just makes life a lot easier. Ollie, can I see Shackleton? <laughs> he's, he's cuddled up with Steph in the living room at the moment. But I'll get him oh, for you in nice. a minute. <laughs> I wanted to kind of broaden the topic a little bit and talk about the way that video has impacted the way that Instagram works for me. Because like, there's been a few people that mentioned Reels, etc., not being an expert. Um, but during September of this year, I ran an experiment and I recorded, I think, 30 Reels of around about a minute, a minute and a half in length, like all around education and all around trying to give people basic insight as to how like Lightroom works or like the pluses and minuses about sourcing, like anything to do with the editing process and compared it on my account. During the month of September, I reached 16,500 unique accounts, but considering my normal reach is around about 800 accounts, that was an enormous uptick. So anybody that is interested in the difference like those are actual numbers i'm literally sat here looking at my insights right now um the average video was reaching about four thousand unique accounts but obviously over the month there was quite a bit of overlap because some of those reels have been seen by the same people um in aggregate that means that sixteen thousand four hundred and sixty six people individual people saw my content during that month most of them multiple times and i noticed instantly that my account started growing again in a way that it hadn't since years ago, like since before the algorithm, to be frank. And if anybody was in doubt as to the benefit of those things, like I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about why I think that was successful for me. And a large part of it was to do with the fact that I put aside any kind of ulterior motive and any kind of promotion and just gave away information for free. So what I was trying to do is make sure that people knew that I knew things about the topic of Lightroom workflow or about color grading or about anything to do with creativity, really, because I wanted to help people. And when I took that approach and showed up consistently, um, it had a massive impact. And you might be sitting there at home or in the audience now thinking, well, that's an awful lot of content to produce. 30 videos is ridiculous. But it only took me one recording session to produce all that content because Instagram does not necessarily need you to make long content or even want it. Most people will decide within the first eight seconds as to whether or not they're actually going to watch a whole video. So if you make the content shorter, it's less of an investment for the person that's watching it. More people finish it, more people get shown the reel, you get more people on board. So it's tr- it's kind of an exercise in saying little bits of very useful information and to as many people as you can. Now, for me, it's different because, as I mentioned at the beginning, like I'm moving more into the education space now. I still do commercial photography, but I'm developing an educational offering. And I was kind of interested to see if anybody else had tried using Reels in any kind of systematic way or with with a proper, consistent approach for their own business. Like, Simon, you nodded. Did you have something you wanted to contribute on this one? Uh, Yeah, yeah. um, It's... um... So I've not been consistent with posting Reels, but in the last year... I probably posted, I don't know, a hundred, but maybe, maybe, maybe around that. Um, so start of last year, I think I sort of started doing it a bit, maybe it was about March time. Sort of did a, did a bit. And then I probably post like one, maybe a day, one every other day for like maybe a month, six weeks. And then as I was doing that, they definitely started to take, to, to like take like traction, but it wasn't necessarily the reel I'd posted yesterday, it would have been the reel I posted eight weeks ago. But I think it's like the consistency. If you post a reel, someone likes likes it, they scroll down, they see another one that you've made, another one you've made. You kind of like start catching people in. So the more you have out there, the more you sort of start to get traction. So my page grew from maybe like 12,000 in March last year. And now I'm at about... 46,000 maybe and my friend Joe who 
I, I sort of saw him doing it and I was like, right, okay, I'll get on reels. He grew from about 10,000 last year and he just clocked over 100,000 from posting That's relatively relatively simple reels um, from travels around Scotland or whatever, we, whatever we've been doing. Um, and I th- like... I guess it's, it's slightly different to weddings. This is, this is in our sort of, I should have said this before, this is in our like travel commercial kind of um, Instagram pages. And so from, from that, like we've then started to get approached for other other jobs that maybe I suppose are more like outdoor-y, influence jobs, I suppose. Like they would perhaps come under that that gauge, but, um, but they, there'll be often companies will approach us for maybe doing a social ad on our pages but it'll also be licensed then for being used on other companies' pages as well. So I think in that regard, having that many reels out there has kind of increased the likelihood of being found and then them coming to our pages and then perhaps seeing what we are offering, I suppose. I, f- I think for, for me, reels has always been kind of like a wide, a wide sort of fishing net to try and gather attention or sort of traction to your page and then they come and then they see what kind of services you're offering. That's, that's, that's how it's been for me this last year. And it's, it's starting, it's been a a long pro, a long process to try to get to a point where it's sort of reaping rewards. Um, But I guess that's the same thing, same thing with anything, isn't it? It's like they're putting the consistency in the time and uh, just keep on putting something out that's, that's valuable. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm starting to definitely see the the benefits uh, in my business um, in the commercial travel space. I haven't applied it to weddings, but I know um, it can be like like incredibly valuable. Perhaps more so because you can get more of your personality across and all the things you're doing. Um, and I guess people are more buying into into that in weddings. So yeah, I think it's super valuable, and I've actually enjoyed it. Like I I, I quite like making videos. I mean, when I when I first started getting into photography and stuff it was because i like making little travel videos or whatever i was up to so I've, I've enjoyed kind of going back to that and like documenting my life and in video perspective and and sharing that and yeah i think it, it can seem like overwhelming and scary but it can actually be quite fun um and a different medium of kind of creating i suppose it's interesting as well you mentioned about commercial projects i saw the work you did with lanks um recently because again like they're a brand that i, I really love they're, they're based about 20 minutes away from my house and they're, they're awesome handmade leather shoes and that's not necessarily a plug for lengths but it's not not a plug for lengths because they're awesome um so but the seeing the way that you dealt with that project and that kind of side of things like it's interesting to see that really your method of onboarding people is like well actually the real is the attention grabber because it's the thing that's instagram is pushing so you're kind of hacking that and being like well this is this is my advertisement this isn't me just like recycling work i'm producing this with the express purpose of widening my reach and like you said you're doing it really intentionally to make sure that you're reaching a larger audience it's kind of interesting to see that so it's not that you're not seeing the community effect it just seems like the missing piece is the reels are now what gets the reach and not grid posts like typical grid posts it's more like you're trying to get people to come to your shop and then you need to have a nice grid so that you've got something good to look at when they actually get there um that said michael and, and i'm conscious that we haven't really heard uh, heard from you have you got anything you wanted to ask or to add um not not to my knowledge um i'm definitely I want to be, first of all, more consistent with just posting photos and just take that baby step. Um, I, I have this tendency where if I'm going to do something, I feel like I need to do it the absolute like best quality that I can. So instead of like just recording videos on my phone to start out, I was just like, I'm going to do a whole, I'm going to set up my camera. Um, I'm going to get my mic. I'm going to like set everything up. I'm going to make my space nice and then like the video that i recorded because i was fumbling over my words uh it took me like 30 minutes to set up and then um i couldn't even use it because it was too long and i couldn't like chop it up and it still sound good so (laughs) um i think i definitely need to let go of some of that perfectionism at first and then refine my quality as i go forward and that's just something that i'm being conscientious about
but uh yeah i don't at, at this point i just like i know the next step and i just need to do the next step before i get to reels because if i focus on everything all at once i just don't do any of it which is 100 percent fair and, and actually the thing you were saying about um starting out with your quality being lowered like i, I did the opposite of that like i started out thinking well how would i do this if it was an interview and I was setting up like a full interview setup. So rather than lowering the quality, I was like, no, no, if I, if I was my client, like how would I do it? And then batch recording so that you had, you made your efficiency by producing a lot of content all at once, which is great. Um, but it, it's, it doesn't tick some of the boxes about spontaneity or being reactive to your audience's needs or being able to produce content based on questions that you got from previous videos so I, th I think if you're looking for practical advice on how to start if you are going to be doing something like this where you're kind of talking to camera you've got a microphone you're, you're doing something a little bit more structured i would say that if you can set something up that can just stay set up and come back and regularly speak to your audience that that tends to have a more a more positive effect i think um for definite and it'll lower the barrier to entry a little bit then you've just got a tripod set there anyway it's just like a really quick thing just to stick your camera on it and, and hit record um but yeah good, good on you for like taking things one step at a time as well that you can sort of make it to suit you like tom i think you've got that you've got that interview video expertise so for you it's very second nature to kind of set up and you want to have that quality but i think there's there's there is really no need to do that and i think the people you know the gen z the people watching reels they want authenticity they want realness they want rawness they want to see what you're actually doing the real stuff they're not as fast on quality you know that's it's it's for, for the for those kind of people which you know more and more we're going to be uh, marketing to like they want to see the real stuff and if it makes it much easier for you just to pick up your phone film what you're doing and it's like the actual real stuff that you're doing and you can post that like why not like it's there's no reason why not and and you know because you can put a cover photo on that's a high quality image you know you could say you're a photographer and you're posting reels you could post a reel of whatever you'd be doing on your phone and then just you can add a nice picture as the cover so it's going to look good on your feed look good on your reels feed but it's it was much easier to make than that and and to be honest you know like some of the reels that do well and you know like you know you're saying about goat videos they're not filmed on like a red 6k camera are they? it's often filmed on a filmed on an iphone and it goes to millions and millions of people you know i, I think it's more the content of it that people are interested in it doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely perfect unless you obviously like it and you enjoy shooting that kind of stuff there's i think it's fair game to be done to do how you want really yeah you know. I'd further, can i can i just add to what um Simon just said though if you i just think it's important to remember why why instagram reels exists it's, it's a reaction to tiktok tiktok and and short form video content right and that is all about being raw and not being too curated and i think simon's absolutely right at that point there's a lot of clients now that are actually asking for the kind of like iphone aesthetic as well when they get videos produced like they want deep depth of field they want it to look like it was shot on a phone because of that because they think it does like look more authentic like the, the main reason why i was advocating for having a fixed setup is because it actually makes delivery easier like if like you were saying before if you're having an issue where you, you can't chop things and you're not sure how to cut and edit like having two camera angles is an easy way of kind of like sidestepping the need to kind of like worry about that because you can cut whenever you like because there's another camera you can cut to um but I, I think Simon like made a good point. Like if if the intention is to to kind of lean into what the platform wants, it, undoubtedly like using your phone is better. Like in terms of just trying to get something out quickly, especially if you're in an environment that's already aesthetically pleasing, you don't have to do much work to kind of make it look good. Um, and like you said, like there's all sorts of apps like Be Real, for example, that kind of encourage that even further. Well, I work with a high end uh, wedding planner and. Uh, twice now they've not had a videographer uh, but they've had uh, content creators there <laughs> and it's like uh, two people a lot younger than myself on their phones just buzzing about and then uh, they have to make they have to go home and make the reels for the next day and stuff like that yeah it's pretty surreal <laughs> and I, I thought they're I thought they're going to be a right pain to work with but that, you actually don't notice them because everyone's got their phones out and they're buzzing about anyway uh, and they're but, just another person with their phones out. And uh, some of the stuff they created was actually uh, like awesome. Uh, 
So there's there's actually a videographer that I know from the states called Savannah Groves, and she she basically only she's a videographer, but she only films on an iPhone. Like her her entire business is all footage that was shot on an iPhone, and it absolutely does not look like it was shot on an iPhone. It looks like it was shot with like a, a big camera with all the rest of it. And I think the the interesting thing is that I think for a lot of people that's kind of going to be their VHS. Like right now, everybody's going nuts for stuff like Super 8 and being like, oh yeah, I love Super 8 film. And like personally, this is, this is probably going to be a hot take. I don't love it. I've, I've graded tons of Super 8 and I don't think it looks good. Um, but the reason why it's doing so well is because it has like a lo-fi nostalgic feel. And we're seeing more and more, if somebody is picking up a, bit, a bigger camera, a lot of people are buying like old flip phones because they want the camera with the small sensor and the kind of smudginess and that they want like camcorders, like the VHS look and kind of these these kind of weird aesthetics that for us feel like the bad bits of childhood. But for some people, it's the right kind of nostalgia or it's it's kind of doing things in a more authentic way. I think as well, like uh, if you ever like uh, took an iPhone photo just after you took one with your DSLR and the confrontational uh, stuff inside the iPhone makes it look absolutely amazing. And you're like, oh, <laughs> I prefer this. Uh, and uh, yeah there's so much uh, conversational and also if you're shooting on the on the iPhone there's that thing where it's the 28 mil uh, and that's how you're used to seeing yourself you're used to seeing yourself uh, taking at that focal length you know you see photos of yourself from iPhones more than you do actual cameras so there's that familiarity of it as well that's a very hard word for Scottish people to say by the way Uh, uh, yeah, so there's that uh, whole thing, but I won't get into conversational photography, Tom, because I know you'll geek out for about an hour on it. So, I mean, actually, that kind of brings me nicely onto one of the topics that you you kind of submitted when you, you kind of signed up, Neil. So um, all of this video talk kind of asks the question, like, if we're going to be expected, if you're going to use a lot of these platforms to produce more video, like, how are we going to be capturing that? It's like, Ollie, I know you guys do a lot of GIFs. So you, you take your stills and you turn them into like little mini videos. And Simon, obviously, you've mentioned that you, you do video too. So you've got video set up right now. But Neil, you are, I believe, are the last person in Scotland that does not have a mirrorless camera. So like in terms of the convergence there, can you talk to me a little bit about like why the resistance? What is it that keeps you on your DSLR? Well, Tom, sit, sit, sit down for this one. I just got my email there saying that my, my mirrorless cameras are on their way. Good grief, uh, knock so me sideways. I, I know, I know. Uh, so I was holding out. I, uh, yeah, I just really like DSLR. So, but then uh, I think Nikon are going to release a new one anyway. And uh, all their Z6 twos were like crazy cheap. Uh, and at that price, I couldn't resist. Uh, so I have two of them coming uh, maybe tomorrow. You see that this is an exciting day. I feel like we 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 had this chat at exactly the right time. We can talk about like your reservations and like what made you you kind of stick with your DSLR. So you mentioned you really prefer the technology. What was it that that you liked so much about the cameras that you had? I'm just used to them. Uh, I'm just so I've been using them 15 years, and uh, it's just second nature to me. I am nervous about the uh, electronic viewfinder. Uh, I'm not sure if I like that, and I don't know about eye focus. So I've got the D780 that's got the mirrorless functionality in the LCD, and I found I'm using it a lot, and I was like, oh, this is quite nice, actually. It's quite snappy and stuff. So, yeah, I thought I'd take the plunge, but if I don't like it, they're they're going right back. Uh, so, uh, But for me, it's the, the, the Nikon colors that I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to uh, sacrifice, but I've been told by so many people that uh, they've kept that kind of nice skin tones and popping colours. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, but as I say, I might just be like that old man. I'll just be like, ah, this is too much, and I'll just send it back. I don't know. <laughs> you see, I, I kind of wonder about that because we were literally just having a conversation about the different character that different equipment's got and stuff like going through trends of being like fashionable and all the rest of it. And you get brands like Leica that make cameras that essentially use focusing technology that's over 100 years old and they still have a following because people get used to a way of working and they like the way that it feels and i think it's kind of strange that there aren't many people that have said to me they prefer the way a dslr feels but 
there's definitely an argument to be made that that experience is is, is different in an interesting and, and very often a better way. Like th- there are photographers that I know that have been incredibly resistant to moving to mirrorless at the, the top end of the, of, the, of the industry. And largely it's because they have a formula that works. They love their aesthetic and they don't want to do something that's going to disrupt it. So I don't blame you for like being like, yeah, I'm going to send it back if it's not perfect because you've got a lot to lose. Like you've, you've worked with this kit for a long time. I might also send it back if it's too perfect. Now, here's here's uh, a question I want to have a long conversation about. This is right in my wheelhouse. I love that. <laughs> I know it all. So, I I am gonna I am gonna run with that. You've 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 teed up the ball now, Neil. This is entirely your fault. So everything that comes after this point, you can blame Neil for this. So I, I am having a little bit of a rant because I'm getting to the stage now where I'm working with quite a lot of photographers on their color process. And very, very, very often we get through their entire edit and the number one complaint people have is like, why is this, there's so much texture in the skin? Like, why does this person's skin not look smooth? Like, why is there magenta in the skin? Like, why do they not look attractive? And I can sum it up in like really quickly, modern camera companies are more interested in selling you a camera than they are in producing a pleasing image. There's an awful lot of money being put into camera technology right now to make lenses sharper. And if you're photographing people, you really do not want that. So if you're finding your skin tones are all crispy, crunchy, one, you might want to look at your presets and work on your color workflow, but that's a separate issue. But two, it could be your lens. Like I I had the the new Fancy Pants Canon 50mm 1.2. That lens is way too contrasty and way too sharp for skin. I was having to suck contrast out of that lens by turning it off in Lightroom, putting negative clarity on it and adding noise reduction. And I realized after a while I was doing so much work just to make it look pleasant on skin. So for me, I can 100% relate to what you said about perfection in cameras and like looking for more and more detail, sharpness and resolution. But I'm getting a lot of nods here. So does anybody else have anything they wanted to add on the topic of the, the camera equipment perfection equation, like how how their kit is and how kind it is to people. Go ahead, Leah. Uh, I know Tom's personal ticks to gear perfection and everything. So it's, I love this topic. It's really fun. Um, so I, I shoot on R6s. I just got the R6 Mark II and um, mostly because I needed another business expense for the end of the year. But um, I shoot on the super cheap, like 35 and the 85 R, um, RF lenses that are like $400 and $500 because one, they're super light and those big L lenses and like the ones that are like as much as the camera, as far as Canons are concerned, they they're super they're as, they weigh as much if not more than the actual camera and for me shooting an eight to ten hour wedding day my hands are just toast at the end of the day so I've started shooting on these like cheaper uh, quote unquote cheaper lenses and I and like all of my photographer friends are like why like why do you shoot on like these cheap lenses these are these uh, you know the red ring lenses that like immediately adds like $2,000 to them are so much better. And I was like, I beg to differ (laughs) on this. Just like, I have that, that, uh, 50 1.2 and I hate it. I absolutely hate it. It like, if you shoot too low of an aperture, something's out of like what you wanted to be in focus isn't because like, it's such a small margin. So it's like, I have an eyelash instead of an eyeball in focus. And it's just too, it's too crispy. And so I found that I've liked the skin tones and the, um, just the overall feel of my photos better on a cheaper lens. And now everybody's like, because it's less perfect. And I was like, I didn't even think about it being like a less perfect thing when everybody's striving for like a perfect crisp, like more in focus photo that me shooting on something smaller makes, you know, smaller and like, you know, not as, you know, expensive actually might make a 
potentially better image that looks better overall to the eye and I don't have to process as much. I boost my sharpening a little bit in post, but like that's it. And I'm always super, super happy with the way my skin tones look and how creamy skin is. And it doesn't look overly like crispy when I'm like, you know, in, you know, you can't see like the little chin hairs that somebody didn't pluck or something like that, you know, like it just has like this overall smoothing. So I don't find I have to like then go into doing too much post-processing work on smoothing skin, like at all, because I'm using something that's like, quote unquote, less perfect. And it kind of does it for me in the shot already. And and that's like a huge thing, because I don't know if anybody, anybody watching this is like, this is my favorite lens of all time. This is a Zeiss Planner 50 millimeter 1.4. This has been around for years it is the simplest optical design of any lens ever it is not sharp but it looks great and for anybody that's ever used a 50 millimeter 1.8 it's the same optical formula um but i think it's interesting that when it's got a zeiss brand on it you might think oh that's a really good lens but even an identical optical lens from canon that costs you 170 pounds like 200 dollars people dismiss it because of the price and i think it's really interesting that the the camera industry has managed to convince people that the equipment that might be correct for them is not right because it's cheaper and it's similar with what i was saying to neil earlier because like neil if, if i remember rightly you're shooting um on, on nikon are you using like a 2858 is that your combo like what's your set of that uh 35 28 and 85 basically uh and yeah that's it's god 24 but very very rare so you're kind of keeping it simple in terms of the number of lenses you've got as well and those like dsl dslr lenses haven't got that same kind of like super clinical hyper sharpness that you tend to find on modern mirrorless glass as well that's why i got this these cameras because they came with an adapter it's like an adapter bundle so i can still use my lenses and get that lovely fallout that i'm used to get the color rendering that i'm used to uh and yeah like you say i'm not going for that clinical sharpness i've had second shooters that have shot sony before and sorry for any sony users out there but uh oh dear uh they just what they done to skin tones and stuff like that uh, uh it just wasn't for me uh, it might be for some people but I, I just didn't like how it made humans look uh, so I, I mean uh- I think I should give Simon a chance to defend himself here. Like, did you want to like, weigh in on this one? There he goes. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I shoot on the A7 IV, which got uh, updated color science. Tom, you're probably more well versed to speak on that. But um, yeah, I, I found I found it to be fine. So I'm, I'm not sure. I think maybe it's just a, slight, it's a very different. Um, it's probably is quite quite different files. So when you're used to editing Nikon DSLRs, your edit is going to look weird on a Sony mirrorless. So I think that's just that's probably just what it goes for. It. But um, I also so I shoot on Sony mostly, and then I have a uh, Leica Q2 that I use more and more. And the um, I found generally a mass, otherwise, talk about massive quite business similar. expenses. Same with, geez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that was last year's one. Um, uh, but I, color-wise, I found them to be quite similar. Apart from, I found the Leica misses more and is a bit softer, and that's actually like what I like. Like, um, I think going back to what we were saying about imperfection, like I think it also links back to what I said earlier about um, you know Gen Z and this generation wanting authenticity and realness and rawness and not being perfect. Um, and I think it's probably what we've wanted quite well the whole whole time. But I think this like glossy magazine image of everything being perfect, everything being super sharp, uh, maybe is we've sort of exited that. We're all we're exiting that phase a little bit, and we want realness and rawness. And you know, I, I use my Q2 like to photograph my friends and family and um, what we're doing. And sometimes the photos are. Sorry, Tom. I didn't mean to swear. <laughs> so you have to edit out. Sometimes, sometimes oh, the... we got to the, the 56th minute. <laughs> sorry. I'm so happy it wasn't me. Sorry, Tom. Oh, Everyone's sorry, so man. good. <laughs> it, it, it's all right, Simon. We'll, we'll let you off. Like it, I, 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 One, one bleep in an hour. I think I'm okay with that. It's um, good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Simon, I use the... I've got the uh, Leica M9. Oh, yeah. And 
and I absolutely love it for its imperfections. Uh, it's got the CD, uh, CDD sensor, so it's the old Kodak sensor, and the colors are amazing and stuff like that, but you can't go above like ISO 800 or it just <laughs> it tears apart. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's uh, one of my favorite cameras. It's, I don't use it for weddings, I just shoot all my personal stuff on it. It's, yeah, I've been starting to think I might start to use the Q2 for weddings, and I've seen a few people start using it. And I'm like, oh, I, I think the the results from it are just they're, pro- they're probably something I could get from playing around with Sony files, but something just looks a bit, little bit nicer about it. And something is I I know a lot of people have spoken about it, but it's like the disarming nature of a small little camera when you're at an event is 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 quite quite nice and um you know I, I i do quite a lot of weddings in edinburgh in the city and often it's quite tight spaces you know in a hotel or um you know wh- wherever we are in the city and having a little q2 i think might be might, might be a little bit just more disarming a bit, bit more like i'm a i'm a guest at a wedding which is kind of the approach I, i'm leaning on trying to want to go down more um yeah, sorry, I digressed a little bit, but I, I think no, the imperfection good. in gear uh, is part is is part of this transition that I think we're seeing from like sort of more perfect imagery to more imperfect imagery, which in a way it's like I don't know if you guys are familiar. There's um, John Dolan is a wedding photographer in in the states, and he released a book last year called the in, the perfect imperfect. He's been photographing weddings for forty years or something something crazy he just did one at the white house and um his stuff is beautiful like really nice but a lot of it's out of focus a lot of it's fuzzy a lot of it's blurry it's not quite it's not the pin sharpness that we would expect but it has that that realness and that sort of timelessness that i think is yeah i i love i love at least tom can we speak about the potentially blurry photo trend next week we, we, we can indeed, and actually I'm about to come <laughs> on to it now. So, um, like, for me, I'm in a sim- similar boat to you guys. Like, I, I picked up a Fujifilm X100V, like, to basically to photograph family a while back. This is before it got nuts and, like, you couldn't pick them up for loving the money. I was going to say, I, Tom, you say you can I'm trying so to casually. find one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the issue for me is, like, this is not... I don't try and get like the normal photography look from this. Like I'm trying to get the look of a Contax T2 or T3 because like the Kardashians did a really good job of making it impossible to buy those now. Um, they're like, I, th- I think the T3 sells for like £2,600 like uh, just for a little film point and shoot that's meant to be like, it's not meant to cost that much. It's supposed to be simple. Um, but basically the way I, I use this is similar to that. Like, so you, I treat it like it's a point and shoot. It's got a 35 equivalent, 2.8 equivalent, which is the same as those lens, those, those cameras. Like it's a 35 to 38, 2.8 on both. And I'm seeing an enormous trend right now of people um, like posting photographs with context T2s and T3s. But these are not photographers. These are people that bought them to take them to parties. And they're using these disposable film cameras with consumer film stocks. And for me, as like somebody that used to shoot film and shot a good bit of medium format, a good bit of 35, it felt really strange seeing people lean into the kind of lo-fi aspect of it rather than just the fact that the colors are incredible and all this kind of stuff. So we're seeing this trend back towards like underexposed, like motion blurry, like second shutter drags, like really kind of deer in the headlights sort of looks from these digital cameras and film cameras. And for me, this kind of scratches that itch. Like it's a really nice way of getting something that looks like your family photo album from when you were a kid. Um, so and I think there's definitely something to be said for that. Ollie, I'm very sorry, like we didn't get right into you yet. So did you have anything you wanted to add on the gear piece, the kind of perfection and perfection elements? Mate, it's probably good you didn't get to me because you know I'm deep in a rabbit hole with all this now. Like we've DM'd privately about this a lot um you know i'm at the point i've got a very expensive 85 canon 85 rf i think it was about three thousand pounds and i'm kind of on the verge of selling that and changing it out for an old efs lens um just because i do find it too crispy um Mm -hmm. one question i've got for you and this might sound really naive coming from a photographer but i'm intrigued does the um does the sensor in the camera make um, a lot of difference towards that sort of crispy over digital look or is it all about the glass on the front of the camera it's definitely a combination um so like for example like um simon mentioned the like a q2 
and that is a 42, 47 megapixel sensor, somewhere in there. Um, so it's really high resolution, but it's and it's also made by Sony. So it's not as if the sensor itself is the problem. Like it's been in other Sony cameras. And where with a Sony camera, you might look at that and think, well, why is this giving me this weird magenta undertone? It's all to do with what's happening in the image signal processing. So when it's getting saved as a raw file, n- cameras don't normally just completely send all that data and save it. There's always something happening to it. So with Leica, they've taken an off-the-shelf chip sold to them by Sony and put all of the time, effort, and money making a lens that pairs perfectly with it and producing colors off that sensor that look pleasing without doing anything to them. Like the, the Leica Q2, is it's one of those cameras that it, it's it costs a lot of money and it isn't it isn't cheap but it, it is genuinely the closest you're ever going to get to getting like a top of the line mirrorless camera with one of the best lenses in the world in the palm of your hand it, it it's it's a, a beast so when you're looking at when you're looking at these things yes the sensor plays a part but if a company is pairing like a softer or more characterful lens with a higher resolution sensor, what you tend to get is a lot of color information, a lot of color depth without any of that kind of nasty stuff that happens to skin. Um, And I think the problem is if a company is trying to grab headlines and win reviewers, resolution is something that you can quantify. And if you can measure it, you can be better at it, which means you'll sell more cameras. And Leica is kind of different in the fact that they can take a different approach and frankly like i know i'm a bit biased but fujifilm are the same like they, they don't really aim for the metrics that a lot of photographers are looking at they don't sell a full frame camera so all of their sensors are noisier because they're smaller like there's all sorts of different trade-offs you can make but does the sensor play a part absolutely but if you've got a really high resolution sensor and a really high resolution lens that's when you get this kind of weird biscuity crispy skin um which is kind of not not my preference for sure so i I do get that but there is also this kind of like um you know like embracing the practicalities of it like there's no doubt that mirrorless cameras say like we use our the the r6 um you know like the frame rate's insane the eye focus is amazing for us out on the hill often in pretty poor conditions we're nailing a lot more shots on our R6s than we were on our 5Ds. Um, <clears throat> so kind of what I'm looking for, like, and I don't know, is it achievable to be using um, something like a mirrorless R6 sensor with some older glass in front of it to still achieve a beautiful look? Or have you got to negotiate an older camera and lose all those modern techs? I probably haven't asked mm-hmm. that very well, but... No, no, you, you did it perfectly. Like, I don't think you do. Like, again, I'm happy for anybody else to jump in if they've got something to add here as well. But like, if you Canon especially, like pairing older EF lenses means that you're going to get a lens design that's older. It won't resolve as much. So you could be using that on an R5, for example, a Canon R5, and still end up with a result that is smoother and more pleasing than what you would get if you tried to record it on like an R6 with a new really sharp lens. It, it's not the, the focus technology that's the issue. It's the fact that they're designing their lenses to, to kind of resolve like charts and not actually be human skin. Um, you see this trend in video as well. That a lot of uh, videographers on the move to 4 and 8K and capture, like so if you're using a RED camera, for example, they'll intentionally choose softer lenses because they want to kind of smooth those hard edges that the sensor is capable of resolving. So actually, when you're looking at the combination, like pairing a modern high resolution sensor with a softer lens can be the correct choice for a lot of people, but it's about making that trade off. And it goes back to what Leah was saying about, I am happy with my 35 millimeter 1.8 because it, it is like a classic lens design, but it's also native for these mirrorless cameras. I guess the problem is that the level of quality that you're willing to accept is different. And if you're using a lens in an edge case, you might end up having to choose the newer optic because of other things like performance. Um, But you shouldn't feel the pressure to do that just because the marketing department from that camera company is saying that this is the best one because it just, because it's the best doesn't mean it's the best for you. Yeah. That's an amazing answer. Thanks Tom. I was just going to say, I'm just so surprised that you like talking about gear. Um, that that's that was a joke. I just didn't think it 
through it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like, that is me. <laughs> I, am the, I am that guy. <laughs> like, what the, you the thing know, is Tom. as well, like, go on, sorry, Leah. I was just chiming in. I was like, well, then you obviously haven't heard anything that Tom has ever said ever about anything, because it's all gear all the time. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And I go to Tom for any gear question. Like, what is the max? What is the least amount of things that I need for the like the maximum output of things? And that is Tom, hands down. I, um, I kind of feel like. So a lot of us are in the photographer education space, um, and I sometimes get a get a little bit annoyed with photographers on Instagram who are posting education content who um, are very clearly unqualified to do so. But um, I don't think it gets like gear from the standpoint that um, Tom, you, you talk about, because you were the first person to talk about gear the way that you do, that I've heard, um, where it's like, it's, I don't know, like, I don't think I'm going to be posting about it because like photographers aren't my main audience in Instagram. To, sort of like tying it back in there but like i wish it was talked about more that like you don't have to have the sharpest thing um or the newest thing in order to make something that's not only beautiful and you're happy with but that your client's happy with too um i shoot on um uh, fujifilm xt4s and i do weddings and stuff like that and like even the my wedding clients that are photographers they either a don't know that unless they like look at my camera and we talk about it because that happens when you're photographing photographers. Um, but they either a don't know that it's full frame, or b don't care. Um, and like, it was um, an option that I could afford starting out that met all the criteria that I needed on the technical specs. Um, but it's also like producing images that I still really enjoy. Um, now, would I explore other options eventually? Probably. But um, yeah, I just don't think it gets talked about enough in the photographer sphere of like gear is a creative process as well as a technical process, if that makes sense. Anyways, that's, that's my L stuff. Literally, because if, if you don't think about the way you're going to photograph something, like how on earth can you get, complain when you get the wrong outcome? It's like if you're buying what everybody else is getting, then you're going to get the same results everyone got. Um, and I mean, like Simon, you mentioned that you, you're looking for more people to kind of make it okay to take the Q2 to weddings, for example. And like I, I know off the top of my head, eight photographers that I can think of right now that only shoot with the Q2 for like 80% of the wedding day. And it... it but those kinds of choices require that you've got a lot of guts when the prevailing wisdom in the industry is that you should be using like one particular camera with one set of lenses. And if you don't do that, it can be a scary thing. Like incidentally, if you do want to have a look at people that are shooting the Q2 to kind of get a feel for it at weddings, like Daniel Kim, uh, John Dolan, actually, I believe uses a Q2 occasionally. I believe that um, Dennis Roy, Colonel, he shoots with a Q2 and makes amazing work. Uh, Paul Williams from Ginger Beer Weddings. I'd continue, but the, that camera is expensive. But like you were saying, Micah, it, it's not it's not always the price that matters. It, it's choosing something that makes sense for you. And if you still love the 5D Mark I and your clients are happy with the results, you've got absolutely no reason to change your kit. But if you're unhappy with what you're getting, making an intentional change is the way that you're going to improve that. Like if you know that all of your images are too sharp, then you probably should just change your lens rather than trying to edit every image differently. And it, it's an efficiency thing. Um, and thank you very much for the things you said about education. That's really kind of you. And I'm um, on that kind of positive note. I think I'm going to kind of wrap up for today and like we'll, we'll come back another time and have these other conversations. So I do think it's all important. Um, and obviously I want to thank all of you for coming and everybody at home that's listening. It really is massive that you kind of investing your time here. And I really hope this has been beneficial for you. Um, so for everybody here, like, and obviously just want to remind you to make sure you reach out to people that have been on the panel today, like let them know that you've enjoyed the conversation. If you have, I'll drop all their Instagram accounts and websites in the show notes. So you can kind of like easily reach out to people and yeah, for everybody here, thanks again for coming and we're going to cut the recording there and we'll see everybody else next week.